Good evening. It is Friday, April 24th of 2020. My name is Scott Harris and I am the staff planetary geologist for Fernbank Science Center and the Jim Cherry Memorial Planetarium in Atlanta, Georgia. Like many of you, it has been almost two months since we were last in our offices and it has been very frustrating being unable to provide our audiences with the normal planetarium experience they would enjoy this time of year. We're not sure when we'll be back in the planetarium, but we do know that the summer is full of important celestial events and exciting new planetary missions, and we have to be able to bring those to you. So, we've decided to launch a weekly online planetarium show of sorts. Our goal is to explore the night sky and give you a little bit of a glimpse of what you might expect to see in the early evening and even in the wee hours of the morning for those of you who are venturing out on early morning commutes. And we want to keep you up to date on those new and exciting missions like the launch of Mars 2020 off to the Red Planet carrying our new rover Perseverance. And even looking at some of our current missions and important milestones like on July 4th, OSIRIS-REx finally sampling the asteroid Bennu to collect materials to bring back to Earth in coming years. If you're not familiar with our planetarium and Fernbank Science Center, please let me introduce it to you a little bit. In its 52nd year of operation, the Science Center is the only center continuously operated by a public school system, in our case, the DeKalb County School District. We feature our 70-foot diameter planetarium, 45 feet high, it provides an incredibly immersive experience. It's one of the largest planetarium domes in the country, and a few years ago we installed a brand new system of dual 4K laser digital projectors to make it the very best it can be. And while I know that when things get back to normal, you'll be in our exhibit hall looking at our meteorite collection, our snakes and and amphibians and the Apollo 6 capsule. We know that you'll be back with us in the planetarium. But I know many of you are really looking forward to looking at that summer sky on Thursday and Friday evenings through our huge 36-inch Cassegrain reflecting telescope, one of the largest telescopes in the entire eastern United States. But in the meantime, we're going to use our digital tools to give you a little different experience. The program I'm going to be using today is called Stellarium. It's an open source program that you can download from the internet. We're going to start our adventure by looking off to the west right after sunset. Tonight's sunset is scheduled in Atlanta for about 8.15 p.m. As we look off to the west, we see, see that glow there leading to twilight. And right above it, you might notice a very bright object. Well, that's our moon. But hopefully you realize something's wrong with this picture. See, when the moon is on the same side of the sky as the sun, that sunlight is actually mostly illuminating the far side of the moon, away from our view. To show you what, I'm look, what I mean, let's look at the moon just a bit closer, and you'll see just a sliver illuminated along the edge just a tiny bit of a newly formed waxing crescent. Most of the light from the sun again is hitting the far side of the moon, but over coming days, as our moon orbits the earth, the near side will become illuminated, headed for first quarter. Half of the near side illuminated from our view on April 30th, before spending the next week headed toward a full moon, at which point the moon will appear on the opposite side of the sky from the sun. Let's zoom back out so we can try to find some more planetary objects. As we move up higher in the sky, we see above the moon tonight an extremely bright object. The brightest thing in the sky besides the sun and the moon, in fact, our sister planet Venus. This time of year, it shines so brightly that it's often referred to as the evening star, or people call up my phone and ask if aliens are invading, and I'm being serious. 
See, it's so bright. If you don't know what you're looking at immediately, it can be startling. And just like the moon, it's one of those objects that seems to follow you around as you move. Of course, that's just an optical illusion. But Venus lurking up there is, is the can't-miss object of the winter and early spring. If we zoom in to Venus, we can notice that just like the moon, it has phases. So we have a somewhere between a crescent and a first quarter Venus. Mercury, Venus, and the moon all being positioned closer to the sun than Earth can have phases. And we see that bright light reflecting off of the white clouds, brilliant white clouds, thick, obscuring our ability to see the surface of Venus. Those clouds, the very upper parts, are droplets of water, like we find in our own atmosphere, right at the cold edge of space. But immediately underneath are grayish-yellow clouds forming, formed of droplets of sulfuric acid, not a place that you want to hang out very long. And beneath all of those thick clouds, we find a colorless atmosphere made of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide so dense and thick that it applies 90 bars of pressure at the surface. That's 90 times what you feel at general sea level here on Earth. It would crush you, making this an incredibly difficult place for even spacecraft to explore. Although... The Soviet Union landed the Venera craft on the surface back in the late 60s to the mid-70s. And later, the United States and NASA viewed the surface through the clouds using radar with the spacecraft Magellan. This is still in a very elusive world with many secrets to explore. We'll come back to Venus in, in just a bit at the end of the program today. Because being a geologist, I have to tell you a little bit about the rocks there. But for now, let's zoom back out and take a look at that sky as the sun begins to set. We're going to go ahead and let time advance a little faster here. Because we want to watch as some of those stars come into view as the sunlight wanes into the night. We're approaching about 8 20 in the evening. As we do this, I'm actually going to stop time just for a moment and direct your attention a little bit more to the southwest. There's not a whole lot to see there yet, so let's make time advance just a little bit more. As the sunlight begins to leave the sky, we'll start to see some of the brighter stars Already Venus is visible, as you saw, but we want to see some of those glowing orbs of hot gas far out into our galaxy. As we get to about 825, 830, and look to the southwest, we should start to see another object come into view. We'll see just at the moment... Ah, we see a bright object there just to the southwest. And if we click on that, we'll identify that as Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the nighttime sky. So bright that my astronomer friends joke that it is, well, seriously bright. It's called the dog star because it is the nose of Canis Major, the big dog. If you have a hard time seeing the dog over there, we'll, we'll help you out in just a minute. But I want to go ahead and have the time advance so that we start to see other stars in this part of the sky. Again, looking to the west-southwest, as the settings, as the sun sets, we'll start to see some patterns that many of you will recognize. I'll speed up time just a little more and we'll start to see some stars in between Venus and Sirius. 
In particular, you'll notice three stars in a line, and everyone recognizes those as the three stars of the belt of Orion the Hunter. You might also know that he has two stars above the belt and two stars below. His kneecaps, including the brilliant blue blue giant star called Rigel, and at the opposite corner we find his right armpit. That's right, it's an armpit. You can say it's his shoulders, but the name of this star, a red supergiant star, is called Betelgeuse, which literally means the armpit of Orion. If we can find Orion, we, we also can find a very special region where new stars and new planets around them are forming as we watch. What we call a stellar nursery we'll see in his sword beneath the belt in a region full of gaseous clouds we call nebula we find Orion's Great Nebula. Hubble, The Hubble Space Telescope has done a wonderful job of imaging that nebula and finding some of the areas where new solar systems are forming. Of course, as we've said, Orion is a hunter and any good hunter must have a good hunting dog and his dog is in fact the big dog over here, Canis Major with his bright nose, the bluish white star Sirius. But if you have a big dog, you have to have a puppy in waiting, right? Well, the puppy in waiting is right up here, the little dog or Canis Minor. If you don't see a dog there, you look for the bright star Procyon. And you'll notice that there's a triangle formed of three bright stars, Procyon, Sirius, and Betelgeuse. This triangle is what we call an asterism. That's just a shape made of stars. And this is sometimes called the winter triangle to compare it with the summer triangle that we might talk about in a few weeks. To complete the story of Orion, though, again, we have a hunter, his hunting dogs. But have you ever wondered what they were hunting? To find the answer to that, we actually need to make it just a little darker. We'll let the sun set a little more, bringing fainter stars into view. And you want to look immediately below the legs of Orion, you'll start to see a trapezoid emerge. That trapezoid is the body, or actually this trapezoid is the legs, and it's attached to another trapezoid that forms the body of a bunny rabbit leap us the hair. Here you see the body, the legs, and right above the body, pointed toward Rigel, are two little ears. As we watch Lepus sort of hop off into the sunset tonight. I often say that if you were a great hunter or a great hero, whether you were on a quest for rabbits or treasure or just doing the, the deeds of the gods, Usually there was also something hunting you, some villain, some beast, some monster. And the monster stalking Orion here from the east? Well, that would be Taurus. Excuse me, from the west here. That would be Taurus the bull. If you don't see a bull there, you kind of want to look for his wrinkled face and his angry red eye. That angry red eye is the red giant called Aldebaran. It's on the edge of a star cluster called the Hyades that forms his wrinkled face. His chest comes down sort of toward the moon tonight. Can't you see him being it's like a, you know, a, a big snarling mad bull just ready to charge into the chest of Orion. But I sometimes say, well, maybe he's not that big and bad a bull because we might notice that in his chest here he has a gigantic heart. Let's zoom in on that heart a bit, just so you can see it a bit better. And we find a cluster of stars, an open star cluster we call the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. Or, if you happen to be Japanese or own a certain kind of car, you know that is Subaru. Let's zoom back out and look at our entire western sky now. We have Taurus here ready to charge. We have Orion defending himself with his shield. We have his hunting dogs, their eyes on the prize here of the rabbit. 
if you have a hard time seeing those, that's one of the reasons that we have planetariums, or in this case, star programs, because with the click of a few buttons, we can really help you out with this. First, we can find those patterns that make up the bull and the hunter, the rabbit and the dogs. If you still have a hard time seeing them, we can always show you artistically what the ancient Greeks and Romans had in their minds when they put those pictures into history. Above Orion, there are two twins. Those are the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux. We have Pollux there to the, to the left, toward the right side of Orion, sort of look directly above Betelgeuse. And then farther to the west, we'll find his brother Castor, their legs dangling down toward, toward Orion's arm. Gemini, of course, is one of the constellations of the astrological zodiac, and Taurus is as well. So if I hit a special button here, we'll see a line emerge. That line is called the ecliptic. That's the equator of our solar system projected on the sky. I often say it's like if you take the sun, divide it into two halves, put a flat plate in the middle, and stretch that plate out across the entire solar system, it's going to intersect our sky here in Atlanta, right along that curve. Well, pretty important things hang out on that plane, or pretty close to it, like planets and their moons and even asteroids. But this is also the line across which our, our planet appears to move as we revolve around or orbit around the sun through the year. So each month, the sun is at a different place along this line and in a different constellation. For instance, in May, it'll be here in Taurus the Bull, in June, in Gemini the Twins. If we move up that line, we find July in Cancer the Crab, and then Leo in August. Each of those astrological constellations, those zodiacal constellations, well, that's what, why they are those, because those are the where the sun was, more or less, when you were born. And as we move across, we see the sort of rectangular body of Leo the lion with a backward question mark making his head and furry mane a triangle attached for his tail. If we move across the sky farther to the, to the southeast, we'll find... Another trapezoid, the body of Virgo the Maiden. And beneath the ecliptic, deep in the southern sky, look for Hydra the snake, the serpent, the evil serpent for those Marvel fans out there, right? Why did the ancients call this an evil serpent? Well, let me show you. First, though, I want, to, want you to realize that this trapezoid is Corvus the Crow and this sort of, of you know, strange, strange pentagon here with a trapezoid attached is Crater the Cup. The cup and the crow are sitting or pecking, in the case of the crow, at the back of the serpent. But you can find those and keep them in mind as we make the pictures disappear. First, we're going to take away the artwork. You still see the crow and the cup and the snake. But Hydra isn't as much defined by where there are stars along this line as where there are none. We're going to actually take away those markers now. Let's even take away the ecliptic. We find the trapezoid of Corvus. We find a bit of a U-shape here, the upper part of Crater the Cup, but beneath it, there's this snaking nothingness. If we make it a little darker, let's do that. Let's run time on, on into the future a little faster so that we can make the sky really, really dark. As we do that, we're looking off to the south where there, the sky is filled with stars. There's so much brightness out there from all of those points of light. But right there beneath the crow in the cup is a band 
of emptiness, a void. Can you imagine how frightened early peoples must have been, how, how even early astronomers would have considered that really foreboding and had to assign a really evil creature for that part of the sky? All right. So we're going to go ahead and move through time. We're back looking at Castor and Pollux there. And we're going to follow that ecliptic. I'll put that back up for you. And we're going to follow that ecliptic through the night. We're going to go pretty fast. Here we're at 10 o'clock, looking to the southwest. We're approaching midnight. And now we're at about 4 o'clock, just before 4 o'clock in the morning. As we look off to the southwest, we find a bright red star called Antares that sits at the end of a fan. I sometimes think of this as a flower with a stem. But the ancient Greeks didn't see it in a pleasant way. Again, they saw it as something evil. They saw the flower as a claw attached to a body with a stinger at the end. This is Scorpius, the scorpion. Again, if you have a hard time seeing it, we can help you out. We'll put that artwork back in. Again, we see the body of Virgo. And then a difficult constellation, Libra the scales. But there's no mistaking Scorpius. And if we could find Scorpius, and it's defined there by its claw and the Red, red giant star Antares. We can curl down the tail right to this portion of the sky that looks very fuzzy. The fuzziness here is from all the light of hundreds of millions of stars coming from great distances in the center of our galaxy, passing through dense areas of dark dust. And it is in that direction where we would find the very center of our galaxy. Right in between the tail of the scorpion, the stinger of the scorpion, and the end of the arrow of the archer, Sagittarius. This is where we would look to find one of those mysterious galactic black holes. As we move over to Sagittarius, we notice this odd geometric form that some people call a teapot. This is another asterism, a shape made of stars that in this case is part of the larger constellation of Sagittarius. You see how this looks like the pot with a little spout and then the actual fuzzy cloudiness of the Milky Way itself looks like the steam appearing out of the pot. But if you want to stay true to the constellations, that's actually an arrow crossing a bow there in the hands of the mighty archer. As we move along the ecliptic, we find more of those zodiacal constellations, including Capricorn, Aquarius. And then you should realize that we're approaching Aries very quickly, which is the sign for, well, right now. <laughs> and so the sun is just about to rise. But ahead of that rising sun, we find a few interesting dots. We're going to go just a little bit farther ahead in time and We'll watch those bright dots travel along, moving to the south. And they will be joined by another bright object. And just to help us out here, I'm going to add some labels. So we will have Jupiter and Saturn and Mars there in the tail of Capricorn right now. So this is a 
if you're up for those early, early morning commutes, look to the southeast and you will have an opportunity to see all three of those planets lined up. Or you can wait till later in the year when they will be much earlier in, in, or they will be higher in the sky by that time and later in the summer start to appear in the evening sky for us. Before we leave this behind, I want to rise up way up high in the sky. and turn around and look to the north. High into the north through most of the night in this time of year, we can find both of the dippers, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. These are not constellations. These are, again, asterisms. They're stars in the shape of dippers. But in these cases, the dippers are part of constellations, namely the Big Bear and the Little Bear, or Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. You probably know that if you take the two stars here of the dipper at the end of the pan and shoot over this way, you will run into a very special star called Polaris, North Star. It's the end of the tail of the little bear or the end of the handle of the little dipper. I always like pointing out that if you are looking at the dippers or the bears, you're necessarily looking north, right? I mean, this is why this star was important, is it was a navigational beacon to early, early sailors to know where they were headed. This is the star that the entire sky appears to rotate around through the night as the Earth spins because Polaris is positioned almost directly above Earth's spin axis. That changes over time, so in a few tens of thousands of years, it won't be right above the axis and it will be replaced by another bright star called Vega. But they kind of play this game throughout all of time. So I'm going to let us go ahead and we'll, we'll come back to our ecliptic here, looking off to the southwest, to the southeast. And I want to go ahead and let the sun rise. We'll bring, we're looking directly east, waiting for the sun to rise. And we have sunrise there at about ooh, just before 6 o'clock. Excuse me, just before 7 o'clock in the morning. And again, we notice the sun there in Aries. And we see the moon and Venus again. So we're going to track those all the way across the sky. We'll stay with the sun. Following along that ecliptic. And we'll look back to the west and wait for the sunset that we started with. And as we watch Venus emerge again, I promise to talk a little bit about the rocks. Well, one of the fun things about Venus is that that incredible greenhouse effect makes the surface extremely hot. It's almost 500 degrees everywhere on the surface of Venus all the time. And Venus has volcanoes and active lava flows. And because the surface is so hot, those flows don't cool down very quickly at all. And so those flows can go out very great distances. Just like on Earth, the basaltic lava flows often are fed or confined in channels and lava tubes. 
and those channels and lava tubes can transport those lava flows out thousands of kilometers. Some of the longest flows are longer than the entire United States is wide, going from Maine to, to California. It's incredible how far some of them go. We first imaged many of those flows back using radar with the Magellan mission in the early 1990s. And um, that was actually the first mission that I was part of. Um, I didn't really analyze a lot of the spacecraft data. My job was to compare the spacecraft data uh, and those results to lava flows on Earth. So I got to go fantastic places like Hawaii and Iceland and Australia looking at current, currently active and ancient lava flows, trying to understand how those lava flows on Venus might work. At that time, even though we saw volcanoes on Venus, we didn't know if they were active. It wasn't until a European Space Agency mission came along the last latter part of last decade and was able to make measurements to indicate that some of the lava flows are very, very young, possibly even erupting as we speak. And that's kind of expected. That, that makes me feel comfortable because Venus is about the same size as Earth and should have very similar thermal properties to Earth. And so it would be a, kind of a surprise if there was no volcanic activity at all. Even though there are many, many differences between the geology of Venus and Earth, it, it just makes sense that there would be active lava flows. And we really want to study those in more detail, but Venus is very difficult to deal with because you can't see through the clouds without using radar, and, and landing craft there is very, very difficult even though you can and, and pictures and measurements have been taken from the surface, the spacecraft only lasts at maximum a couple of hours, and so you really can't have a rover driving around doing the sort of work that we, um, that we do on the moon and on Mars. But hopefully in coming decades we will, we will get craft back to Venus to study it in, in much more detail. All right. So with that, I, I hope you've enjoyed our uh, little version of our planetarium show online. And um, I do want to mention before I leave you that um, we do um, have a special opportunity coming up in the next couple of weeks. We are partnering with Neon Films, the um, production company that uh, made Apollo 11 that we uh, had the privilege of screening for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 last summer. Uh, they got in touch with us and said, hey, we have a new documentary coming out called Spaceship Earth. Actually about, not a spaceship at all, but about Biosphere 2. The important experiment that was done um, some decades ago where um, eight people were put in a confined um, lab out in the Arizona desert to simulate the living conditions of future habitats on the moon and Mars. And so um, they were trying to get this out. Of course, we're dealing with very, very uncertain times. And they thought they would partner with museums and planetariums around the nation uh, to get this out and, and give something, um, something neat this summer for uh, audiences to watch and also for us to help each other out. So. Uh, we're actually going to be providing a special link on our Facebook and Twitter pages and our website uh, probably toward the end of next week where if you um, use that link, uh, you will be able to rent the digital uh, viewing of Spaceship Earth. Um, it debuts on, on May 8th. You'll be able to rent that, though, and if you use our link to go in and rent it, then our um, Fermbank Science Center will receive half of the proceeds from any of the rentals through that link and we'll use that to um, to uh, you know try to do, do our best to have um, incredible stellar programming for you uh, when we do get back in the planetarium. So I hope you've enjoyed our little uh, journey through the sky this evening and um, look forward to uh, being able to do this again next Friday. Uh, as we go here, maybe we'll have some opportunities to do some of these live. I, I don't know. And hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to get these um, you know, better and better as we go along. Um, I hope everyone stays uh, you know, is, is in good health and, um, 
and stay safe. And we really look forward to being, um, you know, back with you in the Planetarium and Science Center in, in the not uh, too distant future. And um, um, really appreciate all of uh, our community support. And if you aren't from Atlanta, um, you know, if you once everything is back where people are traveling. Uh, please, uh, if you make Atlanta a destination, please come see us. Um, we have an incredible facility that we uh, are always eager to share with you. So um, thank you again uh, for joining me for our inaugural presentation of the uh, Your Sky and Solar System. And um, look forward to being able to do this for you again. And if you do have any questions about, the, uh, about your night sky right now, uh, feel free to go to our website, and um, you can get the uh, the email addresses of myself and my colleagues. I can give you mine now, which is it uh, is um, Scott S C O T T dot Harris H A R R I S at Fernbank uh, dot edu, and uh, you're welcome to uh, to send any questions to me. Uh, again, really appreciate your time, and uh, and hope everyone stays uh, very uh, very uh, safe and healthy and happy. And um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you and have a uh, wonderful evening looking up at the sky.